Hi, everyone, and I am Dr. Erin Buchanan. I'm here today to start giving you lectures on Introduction to R. So what we're going to do in this lecture series is break down some of the basics of R and R Studio. So you got my coffee cup here. We're going to get started. Each of these videos, try to keep them under 30 minutes so they're not too terribly long for you. So we're going to take this lecture and break it into three parts. So let's get started. So we're going to first get started by installing R and R Studio, which hopefully you've done in class. But if you haven't done this in class, we'll talk a little bit about how to do that. And we're in, we're going to explore how R works, the key windows that you'll see in R Studio, and including that console, which is the part where the magic happens, the editor and graphic windows. Then we're going to get more into what is a variable, what is a data set, and how do I begin to work with data in the R environment? So what is R? Well, it's free software environment for statistical computing. So you've heard of computer programs before, maybe C++, Python, uh, <laughs> others, Ruby, right? Perl, first my gateway language into programming. And R is another one of those. But his main focus is for statistical computing, which makes it a little different than maybe web programming with HTML or PHP. It's also known as an open source language, as many of them are, because people who develop R allow everyone to access to their code. And so I've developed several packages, which people could take my code and edit and make better. Please do. So in essence, R is a base package that we have that people can add onto their bells and whistles with a reasonable amount of functionality. So why should I use R? Why should I care? And one of the main advantages is the free part because other statistical computing softwares are not free, such as SPSS or SAS, and can be quite costly. The other nice thing about R is that it's fairly versatile and has a dynamic environment. I often tell folks it's not if R can do something, it's how many different ways R can do something. R's written commands are a much more efficient way to work. At first, you probably won't feel this way, but the longer that you work with programming and using this sort of reproducible environment, you'll realize that it's much more efficient than clicking the same buttons over and over again, because you can write code that you can run quickly. So let's all uh, install R. And what you can do is go to the R project for statistical computing. And from this page, you, you pick your favorite CRAN mirror, essentially. So you just click download over here, you click CRAN. I like to pick cloud, but you can pick whichever one is closest to you. And then you pick the right operating system. So I'm on Mac, so I would check to download Mac, and then I would install it like any other Mac program. Now, it does tell you what the latest release of R is, which is Bunny Wunny's Freak Out at the time of this video, or 4.0.3. And we'll, you'll need at least 4.0 for this course, just to make sure we're all on the same page, because different versions of R act differently. All right. Now, the other thing you'll want to install is R Studio. R Studio is an IDE or integrated development environment that makes programming a lot easier. I think a lot of the fear is in the actual writing of the code, but if you have something that helps overlay on top of that and make the whole thing simpler, why not? And R Studio is a great, excellent program. The people who run R Studio also have released many excellent packages that help make coding magic, including um, ggplot2, which is one of the best graphics um, the ways to make plots. And we'll get to learn that later in the semester. All right, so let's click it. Now there are a couple different types of RStudio and you want the free one. So use the RStudio desktop You can click download. It'll take you to the newest version and usually picks up what operating system you're on. So I'm on Mac. And you'll need at least 1.3 for many of the functions to work because different versions of our studio also have different features. And that's the, uh, be sure you install the free version, obviously. One more thing for you Mac people, if you haven't upgraded your Mac in a while, 
You might need XQuartz. XQuartz is a, a plotting graphics uh, program that uh, allows a lot of our plots to be rendered for you, so drawn. And the newer versions of Mac's operating system have this installed already, but if you find that some of your stuff isn't working, you might want to make sure that you have it. You also should upgrade your Mac, but if you haven't, because maybe you don't have enough space, XQuartz might be necessary. And let me just give you an overall note, an overall set of thoughts here that I've kind of percolated over through the years. You can learn this. It is possible. I, hey, I can do it, right? And I, um, for a long time, avoided this, and now I love it. So you can learn R. You will get frustrated. I get frustrated, and I use it every day. And um, there are many days when the frustration is the user because I've forgotten a comma somewhere or I can't spell, which is why you won't see me live code very often. Um, but maybe your frustration is the package's documentation is written very poorly. That's also can be an issue. So you will get frustrated. That's okay. You will get errors that don't help or don't make any sense. The longer you do this, the more they start to make sense. But since this is a community driven project, not everyone has detailed every nuance of something that might go wrong. Google is your friend. Stack Overflow is your friend. Okay. So try Googling that specific error message first. Okay. Unless it's X is not numeric because that one can be a lot of different problems. But try Googling that. Then if that doesn't work, try the specific function that you're running, which will make sense at the end of this lecture, and the error. So like LM plus X is not numeric then just try a bunch of different search terms. Okay. I often tell people that I'm not a genius at R, I'm just really good at searching for what the problem is. And so on that note, let me give you some helpful websites that you might use to get yourself started here. Okay. Quick R, so just statmethods.net, the R documentation website, which is pretty fantastic. Swirl stats, which is actually a package in R that helps you learn how to use R as you have it open. So you're learning R in R. That's really great. Stack Overflow, which is a place where people ask lots of programming questions. And then a really awesome book called Learning Statistics with R by Daniel Navarro that has um, pretty much, oh, it's, all, it's all made of magic and rainbows. <laughs> And so many people like this book, plus it's free. So an outline of what we're gonna do in the next couple of lectures, I'm gonna talk a little bit about commands. What is a command? How do I use it? How do I command my computer to do things? What is an object type? I think that for me, a lot of, a, a lot of my moments where things like really solidified was once I started understanding object types, because R is an object-oriented programming language. So, after I understood what the object was, the thing that's stored on your computer that you're trying to work with, the error messages started making a lot more sense. Okay, so when you say X is not numeric, what it's telling you is that object is not the right type. It wants something that's numeric and your object is not. And so you can start to understand the error messages a little bit better if you have a good understanding of what the objects are. And then in a last video, we're going to cover subsetting and indexing. So how do I get only specific pieces of the things that I'm interested in? What do I do with missing data? How do I even know that missing data is there? Working directories as, as and how to work with um, where files are in your computer, packages, which is what R runs on, and functions. So we're going to kind of break this down into what is the core underneath and then start adding in specific components that are important for a statistics course. So let's jump right in. In this video, we'll finish with commands and then and RStudio as a program. Then in the next video, we'll cover uh, object types. And um, then in the last video, we'll cover all of those sort of like end of things here, subsetting through functions. So the object type section is bigger than it looks. <laughs> So let's go. What is a command? A command is the actual code that you're typing that where you tell R what to do. Okay, it is only a computer program. It does what the operator tells it to do, which is you. And so many of the errors that you'll see are operator error, <laughs> aka you've typed something wrong, you've incorrectly interpreted how you're supposed to code that section. This happens a lot where maybe the 
it doesn't quite tell you what you're supposed to put in that spot. Um, or the function doesn't work like it says it's supposed to work. And commands can be really simple. We'll do some simple ones, or they can be very complex. And computers tell do what you tell them to do. Mistakes happen all the time, <laughs> even for me. So don't be upset when you make a mistake um, because it will happen. It's normal. So with that in mind, what is a command? Okay. And so um, <clears throat> a simple command here might be the x equals four. Okay. So we can type a command directly into what's called the console, which we'll look at in just a minute. And or we can type a document into what's called a script or a markdown file and then tell it to run on the console. So I'm hoping you'll get to see here on this slide that the console is the main place where the magic happens. This is the actual computing section where it takes the, the things that you tell it to do and runs them. Where the script or markdown file, which is what I'm currently using to show you these slides, is where you can save all of that information and run it again later. Okay. So the console is not permanent. It just runs it and it's done with it and it's gone. Okay. With the scripts and the markdown files, we can save what our list of commands to run again. And that's what makes R so magic is that um, that's reproducible. So I can create an entire analysis that someone else could run on their own computer. Just like you, you can run these slides. So a simple command here, x equals four. So our greater than, less than, less than symbol and the minus sign here is a way to set an object, which we'll get more into, but we're essentially setting x as a variable equal to the number four. You can also directly use the equal sign, um, but we'll see with many of the um, programming courses, they really like to use this, um, this, arrow kind of operator, because what I'm doing is saying x is defined, you know, is is four here. Um, but if you see a regular equals, this, it works the same. Now in the console window itself, you'll actually see this time the greater than sign. And that indicates that it's ready to run code for you. If you see a plus sign instead, that indicates that you didn't think you were done running the code. And sometimes you forget to completely close your code. Uh, that makes a little more sense after we do some more complex code. But if you have a lot of code going on, you'll have to remember to finish it. And R knows like, hey, you weren't done with that. So sometimes one of the mistakes I make was I'll forget to finish the code and keep trying to run something below it. And it's like, stop what you're doing and finish. And so the easiest thing to do when that happens and you want to back up is hit the escape key. Capitalization and symbols do matter. So you can use underscores, dots, um, and a couple of other pieces when, when writing code. <clears throat> and the capitalization of the variables and the function names and everything does matter. And then like I said a minute ago, equal to and the assign arrow are equivalent. Now, when you're in the console window and you're typing along, you can actually, this is a cheat, hit the up arrow on your keyboard and scroll through the last commands you've seen. The other option is there's a history window that allows you to see the commands that you've previously run, which is also magic. But to save these for future, future use, you need either a script or another type of document. You can hit the tab key to get some hints, basically. So this is all based on our studios windows, but um, when I hit the tab key, depending on what I'm doing, it might give me a list of variable names or a list of options or arguments to select from. So the tab key differs based on kind of where you're typing and what you're typing. Use the question mark symbol followed by command to learn more about it. And I'll show you how to do that in two seconds. Now let's look at and run a couple of simple commands. So uh, when you see in the notes here, anything in this sort of gray box, that means that I have actually run that within the notes. And so when I write these notes, I write them in what's called a markdown document, which we can see over here. And that allows me to write regular text just like this, along with 
commands. So it's actually running this as an R script in the background. And so that's how you'll know what when there's code to be copied from, um, because it'll be here in a gray box. And in this next couple set of lectures, we're going to show you a bunch of code, which I don't expect you to get right away, but I don't think it's worth hiding the code from you either. So let's look at and run some simple commands. First, where is that console? Right? What is happening with the console? So let's look. Okay, I'm gonna move these out of the way. And then we're gonna look here at RStudio. And the first thing I'm gonna do real quick is kind of close this and switch it back. So one thing I like to do is to rearrange my RStudio and I'll show you why at the end. But one of the first times you open it, you may not have all of the bells and whistles that I have because I've installed new add-ons for myself. But first thing um, that you can do is rearrange. So I'm going to put mine back into the normal order, if you will, just so yours and mine look the same. And then I will properly change it back at the end. So where is this console? What is the console? The console is down here on your normal um, version. So you can open and close these windows uh, so that you can make them bigger and smaller. And as we can see over here, this console is ready for me to do something. And basically this window right here in the console is R. So we installed the program R and then we installed R Studio. Now we don't want to really open R as the program. I don't even know where it is on my computer anymore <laughs> because I only open R Studio because RStudio opens R for me. So this window here is R. And if you were to open that all by itself, that's the only window you'd get. And that would be sad <laughs> because there's lots of other cool things going on here in RStudio that are really useful. And, you know, let's type something simple. So I could say that cheese, which is gonna be my favorite variable all semester is equal to delicious. And so now I've typed a command directly in the console and I've run it because I hit enter. And now it says, hey, I'm ready for some more code. Should notice something has happened over here where it has saved that variable for me. But let's say I made a mistake and I didn't close my parentheses. Well, no, that's not a parenthesis today. That is a quote. Notice how it has the plus icon here. That means it's like, uh, you aren't done. And it knows I'm not done because I need to open and close my quotes. So I can close my quotes sometimes, or I could have hit escape. Notice if you hit the tab key, it will scroll up through things that I have typed before. Or if I come over here and hit history, you can see the things that I've typed before. Can I move these things around? Well, Here's one thing that as we get used to using scripts, so which that's what this window is for, or um, or like our, our files that I had open a second ago. And so I can type the cheese equals delicious here in the script window, nothing's happening, right? So no, nothing's happening down here in the console. I haven't done anything, but I can save this script for later okay, or run it, which we'll do in just a second. But one thing for like, and this is a personal opinion, um, is that I don't love like looking up and down. I'm like, okay, what's happening? I like looking the side to side. So having my notes and my scripts on one side and the output on the other side. So to move those around, I can use our little pane icon, which we did a minute ago. Okay. Click pane layout. And you can put them in whatever order you'd like. Okay, and I like my console on the right. So that's how you'll see when I run scripts for this set of lectures, that's where you'll mostly see it is on the right. You could put whatever window you want, wherever, and you can actually control what is in each window, but I'm gonna leave those mostly as they're set so that it'll at least look the same for you. Apply. The other cool thing that people like to mess with is the coloring system, right? So you can make it all kinds of different colors. I'm on Chrome currently, could use Solarize Dark. I usually try to stick with a white, a white background because it provides the most contrast for people to read. Okay. And there's a bunch of other stuff that we won't get to today. Okay, so I apply. okay. excellent. Okay. How do you run code? 
Well, we've already talked about typing it directly in. So I could say x equals eight here and run it. So you just type in the console and hit enter. Okay. If you hit tab while typing, so let's say I wanted to run a linear model. Now, uh, let's say I'm typing this. You don't have to understand what any of this is. I accidentally hit escape and that yellow thing went away, but I, I really liked having it. Hitting tab, like we talked about a minute ago, shows me what all of my options are. That's really nice because when I forget what the, <laughs> the options potentially are, here they are. Okay. So that's what tab does. And we already talked about scrolling up. Now, the other way to run code is to type it in a script or a markdown document. Okay. Now, in a script here, what we might do is type a bunch of different commands. And I can run these one line at a time or all at once. And to run one line at a time on a Mac, this is command enter. On Windows, it's control enter. So I have control and please run some. I think you can also use control R on, um, on Windows machine, but I'm on a Mac. So command enter or control enter. And what that does is it takes this line. I was about to point like you could see. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a fun, goofy semester. Uh, this line here right, sends it over here to the console. And this is one reason why I like them on the left and right sides, because it's a little easier to see. Other thing we can do, although a little bit slower, is that you can highlight the code you want to run and click run here. Okay. And you don't even have to actually highlight it. It will run whatever line it is currently on. So you can just hit run. Okay. Now I see students a lot of times like highlighting, uh, you know, and clicking run. And that's a little slow personally, if that's what you like, great. But my favorite definitely is command enter because you don't have to move the mouse. <laughs> you can just run all of them at once. The other thing that I've been talking about are markdown documents, which I lost where mine went. <laughs> so let's grab it. There we go. So this is a little set of lecture notes that I'm currently working on. And you'll see markdown documents when you do your assignments. But markdown documents, the cool thing is I can type this text here to make these cool slides, or I can run code. You have code in a block like this, right? Call um, a code block. You can actually run by clicking the little run current chunk is what they're called. Okay. And that's going to send over x equals four. The down arrow runs all the chunks above it. So let's say you're writing a research paper. Right? And this is one thing I do with, with Markdown. And so I have different sections that run different analyses. So I can say, we run everything above this. Now let's try this analysis right here. So it's very handy. Okay. All right, back to the slides. We talked about what is a script, what is a markdown, and how do I run code in those. So let me prove to you that that was what was on the slides. So we've covered all of these. And you'll get practice using all of these um, throughout the semester. All right, one last thing before we go in this lecture. What, is, uh, what are the windows in our studio? Right. And so we've talked a little bit about these two. Right. So this um, scripting window here. Sometimes it's called the um, source environment. Okay, so it's going to be called source in their language. We talked about the console window over here. And when we're using the console and the script window, okay, there, there's going to be a couple of other options here, but one of them is our markdown. And that basically just like when you um, use a markdown document, it will sort of process in a separate window. And so this is called knitting. When I convert that R markdown document into the file that it's supposed to be. Okay, so I made these slides by writing a slide markdown document. And if I want to recreate those slides, like I screwed up, there's a typo. I've got to fix that typo. Obviously, in this window, I can't, there's no typing, it's just clicking, right? So I come back over here, fix my typo, and hit knit. Knit creates that document over again. So I love this. I can't tell you the amount of hours that I spent writing research papers where I mistyped a set of numbers in a table somewhere. And I had to recreate the entire table, re backspace and not screw up. And Word is like, you know, making lines 
and just doing goofy stuff. Okay. In Markdown, I just fix the problem with my code, hit knit, rerun the whole thing, and it's fixed the table for me. So pretty magic. I'm clearly biased here, but uh, and then we won't use jobs right now. But if you want to run multiple scripts at once, you can use jobs. All right. Let's talk about these other two windows that we haven't covered yet. So I'm gonna make them bigger. The other two main windows are the environment window. And the environment window is um, where all of the variables that you're currently used are saved. So if you use just regular R, you can't see what it has saved in memory. Okay. When I say saved in memory, I mean like current, these are currently available for me to start using and typing. Okay. So if I come up here to the console, make it a little bigger. Okay. I can type cheese and it tells me it's delicious okay. because cheese is a variable I have saved. So I put it in, now I can get it back out. I can get X back out and Y because they're all variables that are saved. Okay. And so the environment window just allows you to see what you currently kind of have open, it kind of shows you the open things, if you will. Okay. Now there's plenty of other things that are kind of hidden in the background that are always kind of open. And we'll see that in the next set of lectures. Uh, but this tells you the things that you've kind of created and have open. Okay. And so that's really nice. Uh, there are a couple of other options that I really like. One of them here is broom. Um, when in doubt, broom it out. So if you're having a lot of trouble and you're not sure if your code is running correctly because maybe you saved it previously the wrong way or something, the broom icon should be your favorite. And it just clears the environment. So now if I typed cheese, it would tell me that it doesn't know what it is because I've kind of cleared that out. Like clear it out, let me try, let me start over. So when in doubt, broom it out. We also have uh, another couple of phrases, but they're not PC friendly. <laughs> so when in doubt, broom it up. Okay, some other importing data set options. We'll talk about those later okay. and a couple of save workspace options. But if you have the code saved, you don't need to save the workspace. History here is pretty great. I can see the history. And then I've actually recently figured out I can double click on a history and tell it to rerun. And that's useful if you can't remember what all of you tried to run and it shows me all the um, R markdown stuff that ran. Okay. So you can tell it to go to console or to source. So you can stick it in your uh, script. Like, oh, I forgot to write that down. Okay. Connections, not one we'll use a whole bunch this semester or any of these other uh, get ones except tutorial. So we will use tutorials this semester, but that's in a different video. Okay. The other window is gonna be our file um, <clears throat> file window. I'm making sure I'm not forgetting anything over here. Okay. Files, plots, packages, helps. Okay. And so files here shows me the files in my current folder. So that's really useful. I'm currently working on uh, the package for this class. And so we'll be able to have our tutorials and everything right all in one set of files. Okay. Plots is where you'll see all of the pictures that you've created. Packages are all of the packages that are installed. So these are all the add-ons that we can add on to the basic R. So it comes with several packages for you already, but then we can add a whole bunch more to it to do specific cool things like Bayesian statistics. Help is the window where you can see. So the last thing apparently I asked for help on was flex table because I couldn't remember the call keys argument. <laughs> Um, but if I don't, if I want to help on something that I wasn't sure, like LM is a linear model, I can just do question mark LM, that's a function name. And it will pull up the help if available for that function. And then it scrolls through and it tells you a bunch of stuff that hopefully is helpful. And so a lot of these functions are well documented. But if it's kind of blankish here, like there's not a whole lot, that just implies that the person who wrote that package didn't add a whole bunch of help. Okay. All right, what am I forgetting? Um, oh, and then viewer. I have viewers where you can actually, I could like view the slides as, as I'm building them. Um, mostly you won't use viewer this semester. So we'll mostly focus here on files, plots, and packages. Okay. All right. Now to keep these from being too long, we're gonna break them up. So the next section up is gonna be about object types and we'll start typing code ourselves. And so head on over to that video.